Good, good, good. ಭ್ರಾಂತಿರೂಪೇಣ ಸಂಸ್ಥಿ ನಮಸ್ತ 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 ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಟು ದ ದೇವಿ ಹೂ ಅಬೈಡ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಎರ್ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಈವಲ್ ಸ್ಯಾಲ್ಯುಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಸ್ಯಾಲ್ಯುಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಸ್ಯಾಲ್ಯುಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಅಗೇನ್ and again Good morning everyone Let's be honest things aren't going great in the world We've got the ongoing situation in Israel and Gaza I just read in the newspaper a couple hours ago about a terrible terrorist attack in Moscow in a concert hall I think over 130 people were killed. But these things happen more or less on a daily basis. These kinds of atrocities, terrible suffering, evil throughout the world. And it'll make any thoughtful person wonder why. Especially those who believe in God. Why is it such an issue for people who believe in God? Well, because by definition god is supposed to be supposed to have a number of wonderful qualities one of which is omnipotence another one of which is to be perfectly good perfectly loving right we are imperfectly good god by definition should be perfectly good we are weak capable of very little god omnipotent all powerful but then what's the problem the problem is this If God is both omnipotent and perfectly good, perfectly loving, then we seem to have a problem on our hands, philosophically speaking. The problem is this. If God is perfectly good, God would want to prevent us from suffering, just as any good mother will want to prevent her child from suffering. If God is omnipotent, God should be able to prevent us from suffering. That's what all power being all powerful means. any suffering that i might undergo god will say no you don't need to suffer that i'll prevent it because i'm all powerful god is supposed to be both these things now if god is both omnipotent and perfectly loving logically speaking one might think then we shouldn't suffer now there are two different ways of catching this out this problem of evil one is there shouldn't be any suffering at all that seems to me less plausible than the view that there shouldn't be as much suffering and as terrible suffering as we see around us there might be some suffering but not to the degree that we see on a daily basis okay this is what's called the problem of evil in philosophy in theology it's a massive problem it remains a kind of unsolved problem in western philosophy and theology Um I say unsolved uh some people might think it's solved but the very fact that the question keeps being raised again and again and that so many different solutions are being presented none of which has is receiving a kind of unanimous acceptance or support suggests to me that the problem is ongoing that it hasn't really been solved I'm talking in a western context in an indian context it's quite interesting the problem was not really explicitly raised very much in the Indian tradition. And there's an interesting question about why. And we'll I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later. But today I want to actually focus on this really really important urgent, really it's an urgent question that we all have, I think, that most of us have at least. It's this problem of evil. This problem of evil comes in two main forms one is in the form of an argument against god's existence if you're a skeptic about god 
This is one of the most powerful arguments that you can present. People like Richard Dawkins, he's a, a famous atheist. He's a biologist at Oxford. He wrote a book called The, the God Delusion. Right. The idea being that God doesn't exist, and one of his main arguments against the existence of God is the problem of evil. If God did exist, there shouldn't be so much evil, but there's a ton of evil, therefore, God doesn't exist. This is one of the arguments. So atheists and agnostics who are questioning God's existence often raise the problem of evil. One strategy for responding to this kind of argument against God's existence is to drop one of the two main attributes of God. Uh, J John Stuart Mill, whom Swami Vivekananda had read as a philosophy major at Scottish Church College as an undergraduate long back in the 1880s, uh, he read John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill, in one of his essays, he takes this tack and he says, it's true that if God were omnipotent and perfectly good, he would prevent the suffering that we see around us. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, God is not omnipotent. So he loves us, but he's helpless because he's not, and he's not as powerful as we usually think he is. So don't blame God. God's off the hook in that way by dropping that attribute, the omnipotence attribute. But there's another tack, there's another strategy you can take to get God off the hook. Uh, Vidya Sagar takes this approach, interestingly. The great uh, Bengali pundit who met Sri Ramakrishna, I'm talking about it in my gospel class right now, actually. Vidya Sagar, he says, I'll, I'll come to the context a little bit later, but uh, I'm just giving, I'm cutting straight to the chase here. What is Vidya Sagar's solution to the problem of evil? He says, God is omnipotent, but why do we see all this suffering? because he, he's not perfectly good. <laughs> so it's a kind of, I, mean, I don't know how far you want to push it, but you know, he's, 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 he doesn't love us as much as he should, and therefore he, he's capable of preventing the suffering, but he doesn't. And so then he says, in a mood of peak, he said, M writes this, he says, Vidya Sagar says, so therefore, even if God exists, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Because what good is that kind of God that doesn't love us? Okay, we'll get to Vidya Sagar's more detailed objection in a minute. But there's a second form that the problem of evil takes. You don't need to be an atheist. You don't need to be an agnostic. You can be a good, sincere, spiritual aspirant. You can believe in God, and still you can raise the problem of evil. This is very common. That's why the problem of evil is raised repeatedly in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. People again and again, all of whom believed in God, will come to Sri Ramakrishna and say, but why, 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 why all this suffering? Why all this suffering? So you can raise the problem of evil as a spiritual aspirant and, and as a believer, as a person of faith, actually. And I think that's more relevant to many of us because we're here, because we're spiritual aspirants, and we do have some faith. Why would we raise this question? Because it comes up in our daily lives. Each one of us has, or if we haven't already, we will face some kind of personal tragedy. Terrible suffering. Our own suffering, the suffering of loved ones, and when that happens, we ask why. This is extremely natural. And in moments, so when things are good, then this problem doesn't really arise. But when things are rough, and every one of us will go through these rough patches, the problem inevitably comes up. It's just natural. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing. And in those moments, we need to ask. As followers of this tradition, many of you are, you know, belong to the Ramakrishna Vivekananda tradition. How might Sri Ramakrishna respond to this problem? How does Sri Ramakrishna respond to the problem? It's not a might, because he does respond to the problem. So I want to spend the remainder of this talk explaining Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil. Why does God, who is by definition perfect, perfectly good, perfectly omnipotent, omniscient, knows, so that's another attribute. He knows, he's all-knowing, which means he knows where all the suffering is happening. He knows that this is happening in Gaza, this is happening in Moscow. Why couldn't he have prevented it? He could have, but he didn't. Why? What's Sri Ramakrishna's answer? So, I'm going to, in a nutshell, kind of summarize much more technical and fully worked out arguments made in chapter seven and eight of my book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality. I think that Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil has three main dimensions. 
so I'll explain each one in turn. But one sort of methodological caveat before I embark on this little adventure is this, that Sri Ramakrishna didn't produce a textbook or a philosophical treatise to explain his response to the problem of evil. What I've done instead is I've went through the gospel carefully in the original Bengali, Kotamrita, and I looked up all the different places where the problem of evil is raised by different visitors. And I look at all of Sri Ramakrishna's responses to those different questions, queries, and I try to put them together and bring them into a kind of harmonious whole. That's called, in scholarship, reconstruction. He didn't give us just a, like, a, in one place, a definitive answer to the problem of evil. What he did is he, gave, he gives different responses to the problem of evil in different contexts. And I'm trying to bring them together in my own way. And you can disagree with the reconstruction. But this is what I'm presenting to you is my uh, reconstruction of Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil based on scattered passages throughout the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And in, in at least one place in the Leela Prashanga, the biography of Sri Ramakrishna written by Swami Sharadanandaji. So what are these three main dimensions? Let's go through them one by one. The first is what philosophers call skeptical theism. I'll get to what that means in a second. Let me begin by revisiting Vidya Sagar. Remember, I promised that I would get back to Vidya Sagar. Here we are. 14th December, 1882. M, the author of the gospel, he tells Sri Ramakrishna, Vidya Sagar said the following. He is really angry at God on one occasion. And he said the following. So M is saying to Sri Ramakrishna, once Vidya Sagar said in a mood of peak, what is the use of calling on God? Just think of this incident. At one time, Genghis Khan plundered a country and imprisoned many people. The number of prisoners rose to about 100,000. The commander of his army said to him, your majesty, who will feed them? It is risky to keep them with us. It will be equally dangerous to release them. What shall I do? Genghis Khan said, that's true. What can be done? Well, have them killed. The order was accordingly given to cut them to pieces. Now, Vidya Sagar speaking. Now, God saw this slaughter, didn't he? But he didn't stop it in any way. Therefore, I don't need God, whether he exists or not. I don't derive any good from him. This is Vidya Sagar, Sri Ramakrishna, in response. Is it possible to understand God's actions and her motives for acting? She creates, she preserves, and she destroys. Can we ever, ever understand why she destroys? I say to the Divine Mother, O oh Mother, I do not need to understand. Please give me love for thy lotus feet. The aim of human life is to attain bhakti. As for other things, mother knows best. I have come to the garden to eat mangoes. What is the use of my calculating the number of trees, branches, and leaves? I only eat the mangoes. I don't need to know the number of trees and leaves. First thing is, he was fond of this mango analogy. I think we shouldn't be misled by it. I don't think he's saying here, in response to Vidya Sagar, oh, why think about these things? Don't bother. Better not to think about these things. You know, be like an ostrich in the sand and forget about it. Don't worry about all the suffering in the world. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think it would be a mistake to interpret, you, you've come to eat the mangoes, so don't count the leaves in that way. I don't think that's the right way to interpret it. And in fact, he's not at all dismissive of the concern that Vidya Sagar raises. Notice, but it's easy to miss the philosophical kind of depth of what he's saying. That's why I want to kind of highlight it. Let's go again in the first sentence. Shramkrishna's first line response. Is it possible to understand God's actions and her motives for acting? This is what contemporary philosophers and theologians call skeptical theism. What does that mean? It means, why should we think with our finite minds? We are very far from omnipotent and omniscient. Why should we even think? Why is it reasonable to think that we should understand, have a good grip on why God permits certain instances of suffering from, why, why God permits it to happen? Why doesn't God prevent it? We may not be able to understand 
why God permitted this particular instance of suffering, that particular instance of suffering in Gaza or in Moscow or here or there in India. We shouldn't jump to the conclusion that because we can't understand why God does or does not do something, that God had no good reason for allowing the suffering to occur. That's what skeptical theism means. This is a little bit abstract, and so um, philosophers have helpfully given analogies. I, I especially like one of them given by the philosopher William Alston. He's the example of two chess masters. I might be modifying it a bit, but in any case, this is the gist. Imagine Magnus Carlsen, the world's greatest chess player right now, living, playing with another great chess grandmaster. Let's throw in Pragyanand, if any of you are familiar with chess. He's a young kid. I think he's only 18, but a great chess player. They're playing each other. I know the rules of chess, but am terrible at chess, which is actually true. And imagine that I'm a spectator watching this match between two great grandmasters. Magnus makes a move, a really weird move in my eyes. He sacrifices his queen. And I am like, why would you sacrifice the queen? It's the most powerful piece on the board. Now, as a terrible chess player, but who knows the basic rules, who doesn't understand why he's sacrificing the queen, is the right response, what an idiot. Shouldn't have done that. Or, wow, this is a bold move. Let me see what he makes of this, and let me see his, the, the method behind his madness. I think that the latter response would be more reasonable than the former. That's skeptical theism. Why should I even th expect to understand how the mind of a chess grandmaster works, let alone God, who is by definition omniscient and omnipotent? Do you, do you see the idea? So I think Sri Ramakrishna is making exactly this point. And how do I co corroborate this? Because he says the same thing in different ways throughout the gospel. He says, can a one seer pot ever hold 10 seers of milk? What does he mean? The one seer pot is the finite human mind. Can it ever grasp, can it ever understand why the infinite, omnipotent, illimitable God does what he or she does? No. Why should we even expect to? That's skeptical theism. It's a, cert it's a certain kind of humility. It's the idea that I genuinely don't know why God is permitting the suffering. But because I am me, I, I'm, I have a finite mind, I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that God had no good reason. God can very well have a good reason for doing it that I just can't fathom. Because I'm not omniscient, I'm not omnipotent, how can I know? But let me trust in God. This is kind of Job's re response, if you look at the book of Job in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. He says elsewhere, Sri Ramakrishna, how can we understand the ways of God through our small intellects? See, again and again, he's emphasizing the same point. How can we understand the ways of God through our small intellects? This is skeptical theism. So, so this is the first dimension, I think, of Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil. It's not a complete response in itself. Why is it not complete? I think for this reason. There's so many different instances of suffering. I mentioned Gaza, I mentioned the Moscow attacks, but we can multiply. Even going on right now, we can multiply examples, right? What skeptical theism says, with respect to any particular instance of suffering, be it in Gaza or Moscow, we may not always be able to understand why God permits that suffering. At the same time, we can ask more generally why God permits so much suffering in general. Do you see the difference here? This is a bit of subtle philosophically. We, we, we really shouldn't expect to understand why God permits each individual instance of suffering throughout the world in the US, in India, in Gaza, in Moscow, et cetera, et cetera. But in a general way, we can ask for general reasons why God might permit suffering that we, the suffering that we see around us. That project of giving reasons why God might permit suffering in the world is called theodicy, another technical term used in philosophy and theology, theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. The term was coined by Leibniz, the great philosopher. DJ means justice, and Theo means God. So it's basically defending God's ways 
to human beings and saying, yeah, God does have good reasons for permitting the suffering that we see around us. That still doesn't explain particular instances of suffering, but it's giving general reasons. And I think that the second and third dimensions of Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil are a very sophisticated theodicy. So his response combines skeptical theism with a theodicy. And you have to take the package as a whole. You can't say that his response just consists. That's why it's so dangerous to just take certain passages out of context and say, this represents Sri Ramakrishna's ultimate view or complete view. If you just take the Vidya Sagar passage and see Sri Ramakrishna's response, you only get skeptical theism. You don't get the theodicy. But if you go elsewhere and you look at other passages, you'll find that he's also emphasizing theodicy. And I think you have to take all of his responses together comprehensively. That's the best way to get his overall position. Okay, that's a, a kind of a general suggestion I have for reading the gospel. Try to be comprehensive. So, second dimension is what I call his saint-making theodicy. It'll take some explaining to get to what I mean by saint-making theodicy. But again, I'll just reiterate again. What does theodicy mean if you're sleeping for the past two minutes? Theodicy means explaining why God permits all the suffering that we see around us, okay? What reasons might God have in a general way? So, Hari. Who is Hari? The future Swami Turiyananji. He asks, why is there so much suffering in the world? This is the problem of evil raised by a believer and a very sincere spiritual aspirant and a very advanced soul. Sri Ramakrishna says, this world is a leela of God. It is like a game. In this game, there are joy and sorrow, virtue and vice, knowledge and ignorance, good and evil. The game cannot continue if sin and suffering are altogether eliminated from the creation. In the game of hide and seek, one must touch the granny in order to be free. Most of us have no idea what this game is about. I also have never played it, but in any case, there's a granny which you're trying to touch in order to win. But the granny is never pleased if she is touched at the very outset. It is God's wish that the play should continue for some time. Okay. Shramkrishna's response doesn't stop there, but I'm going to pause and pretend that it stops here, and then I'll pick up where he leaves off a little bit later. Because as I said, what I'm giving is a reconstruction, so I'm giving kind of logical development of Shramkrishna's response to the problem of evil. So let's stop here for a second. What is Shramkrishna saying here? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Well, even that suffering is part of God's play, God's leela. Duryanji is a smart person, one of the most brilliant direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. His next response is immediately, he's ready with another rebuttal. He says, but God's play is our death. Why does God play in this way that entails so much suffering and death for others? We'll get to that in a second, but we're not there yet, so let's not jump the gun. But it's a very important question. See, a child, when the child plays, yeah, the child might do some pretty cruel things sadistic things. Young kids especially, they like torturing, some of them like torturing little helpless creatures, insects. But they're kids and they're, you know, they're not fully developed. They're, some of them are not even yet moral beings, so they do it. But God? Is God like a sadistic child playing with his poor creatures? That's terrifying. So we don't want that. So that's not enough. Just saying that this is all God's play, not enough. Skeptical theism, not enough. Just saying this world is God's play and that God's play naturally has to have both good and evil, not enough. But they're all parts of a comprehensive response. So I'm kind of building. Another passage in the gospel. His neighbor, Sri Ramakrishna's neighbor, asks him, why do human beings have sinful tendencies? Pap buddhi, papa buddhi, Sri Ramakrishna. In God's creation, there are all sorts of things. She has created bad people as well as good people. It is she who gives us good tendencies, and it is she again who gives us evil tendencies. Neighbor, in that case, we aren't responsible for our sinful actions, are we? Logical question. Sri Ramakrishna, God has ordained that if one commits sin, one has to reap the fruits of that sin. Won't you burn your tongue if you chew a chili? In his youth, Muthud led a rather fast life, so he suffered from various diseases before his death. Neighbor, why has God created wicked people? Sri Ramakrishna, that is her will, her play. In her maya, there exists 
avidya as well as vidya. Avidya means ignorance, vidya means knowledge. Darkness is needed too. It reveals all the more the glory of the light. There is no doubt that anger, lust, and greed are evils. Why then has God created them? In order to create saints. Mohot lok to yir kurbin bole. In order to create saints, one becomes a saint by conquering the senses. Is there anything impossible for one who has subdued his passions? He can even realize God with the grace of Divine Mother. Then he concludes by saying, wicked people are needed too. God has created all kinds of things. She has created good trees and poisonous plants and weeds as well. Among the animals, there are good, bad, and all kinds of creatures, tigers, lions, snakes, and so on. And a little bit later in the same dialogue, the neighbor asks, then householders too will have the vision of God, won't they? Sri Ramakrishna. Everybody will surely be liberated. Extremely important. Everybody will surely be liberated. But one should follow the instructions of the guru. If one follows a devious path, one will suffer in trying to retrace one's steps. It takes a long time to achieve liberation. A man may fail to obtain it in this life. Perhaps that person will realize God only after many births. There's a lot going on here in this passage, and it requires a lot of unpacking. But the overall gist is, why is there so much suffering in the world? God's play contains both good and evil. Why does God's play contain, contain so much good and evil? God's play is not aimless or just kind of just for the fun of it like a child might engage in play. No. It's teleologically oriented, which is just a fancy way of saying there's an aim behind the play. In any kind of sport, sports are also kinds of play, but there's an aim. In football, you're trying to get, I mean uh, soccer, you're trying to get, you score goals, right? By shooting into a goal and so on. Every, every sport has a kind of aim. So there's also goal-oriented play. God's lila is like that. There's an aim. What's the aim? God wants to make saints out of each one of us sitting here today. That's the aim. You might think, what a weird way to make us saints. <laughs> but no, there's a logic. And he explains the logic. That's the beauty of Sri Ramakrishna. He's a very sophisticated philosopher, and we don't give him enough credit for that. He says, he gives a very concrete example. There's no doubt that anger, lust, and greed are evils. They make us do terrible things, horrendous things, unthinkably bad things. Why then has God created them? In order to create saints. What's the logic? One becomes a saint by conquering the senses. Is there anything impossible for one who has subdued his passions? You can even realize God by the grace of God, by subduing your passions. What does that mean? It means all of these evil qualities that we see in ourselves, and that we see throughout the world and others, these help us to grow morally and spiritually. It's only by reckoning with, grappling with, our own selfish tendencies, egoistic tendencies, the, the lower impulses, that we can learn what happens when we indulge them, when we act according to these lower impulses, it's also how we, when we observe the consequences of our actions, when we do those things, what happens? We suffer. That's why he says, if you eat a chili, won't your tongue burn? We reap what we sow. We'll get to that in more detail in a bit. Right? And when we see it in, in others, we know, whoa, look, so-and-so did this terrible thing, and as a result, this is what's happening. Let me try to avoid that in the future. So we learn a tremendous amount by making mistakes ourselves, and by observing the mistakes of other people. Okay, that's the basic idea. And that it's, it's just like resistance training. You have to push yourself and challenge yourself in order to grow your muscles, to strengthen yourself. In the same way, if you didn't have these evil, evil is kind of too loaded a word, but in any case, these, these lower tendencies, these selfish tendencies, you won't be uh, sort of encouraged to, or even allowed to, develop your moral and spiritual muscles to overcome these lower impulses. That's the basic idea. You need that pushback from yourself, from the world, in order to grow morally and spiritually. So this world is a kind of moral and spiritual gymnasium. This is a, an analogy used by Swami Vivekananda as well. It's a gymnasium in which we have come to grow strong morally and spiritually. 
we've come to evolve. And that evolution is not one that, take, that, that occurs from start to finish in one life. It's a journey of many, many lifetimes. So there are three key elements in Sri Ramakrishna's saint-making theodicy, which is a second dimension of his overall response to the problem of evil. First element is karma and rebirth. Famous doctrines of Hinduism. I'm writing a book now called Karma and Rebirth in Hinduism. I'm sort of knee deep in scholarship on it. It's very complicated actually when you go into the weeds. But I'm gonna give a very uh, general uh, sense of Sri Ramakrishna's understanding of karma and rebirth and why it's relevant to the problem of evil. He says in one sentence, or two sentences, God has ordained that if one commits sin, one has to reap the fruits of that sin. Won't you burn your tongue if you chew a chili? That's the doctrine of karma in a nutshell. We reap what we sow. Simple idea. If not in this life, then in a future life. Because the immediate question is, well, many people who do terrible things get away with it, seem to get away with it. They seem to live quite nice lives sometimes. Eventually, they will reap what they sow. We may not see it in this lifetime, but their soul will continue into a next birth. They might pay for it in between births, in some kind of purgatory or even some kind of temporary hell, or in their next birth when they take on another body. But everybody will eventually reap what, what they sow. But more than that, often people think that Hinduism believes in a karma theory based basically on retribution. It's what's called the retributive theory of karma. Karma is punishment, or it's reward. It's reward and punishment. If I do something good from a karmic standpoint, something unselfish, God rewards me with a lollipop. If I do something bad, either, either slap on the wrist or something much worse. <laughs> Sometimes much worse. Reward, punishment, reward, punishment. And so what happens? The karma doctrine is a, a, a kind of, it becomes a sort of utilitarian doctrine. If you want to be happy in the future, you better do good. If you want to avoid suffering in the future, you better be good. Because we all reap what we sow. But the problem is then, in a sense, nobody does good for good's sake. I'm doing good for my own benefit, my own future self, so that I can be happy basking in heaven for a long time and then getting a nice birth in the future. Something seems off there. I think Sri Ramakrishna, not just Sri Ramakrishna, but the whole tradition that he inaugurated, this kind of integral Vedanta tradition, Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, others, they defend a different way of understanding the doctrine of karma. They fully agree with the traditional Hindu view, we reap what we sow. But they say that the primary purpose of karma and rebirth is not reward and punishment. It's our moral and spiritual evolution. So I would suggest that Sri Ramakrishna champions an evolutionary conception of karma and rebirth. Evolutionary versus retributive. The standard understanding of Hinduism is karma is retributive. I do something good, I'm rewarded. I do something bad, I'm punished, either in this life or in a future life. Evolutionary conception is we do reap what we sow, but what's the overarching purpose behind that doctrine? our own moral and spiritual growth with the aim of becoming a saint, with the aim of realizing God for ourselves. And every single one of us will eventually realize God. What a wonderful idea. That's the third part. I'll get to that in a second. So the third element in his saint-making, the, the first element in his saint-making theodicy, an evolutionary understanding of karma. Second element, rebirth. The two things go hand in hand, obviously. Karma and rebirth sort of mutually entail each other. This is a journey of many lifetimes. That's why even if we don't reap what we sow in this life, we'll reap it eventually in a future life. There's a real problem here in a Western context because Orthodox Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they don't accept rebirth. Why is that a problem? Well, a two-year-old baby, let's say, suffers terribly from some kind of incurable cancer. It happens, passes away. What in the world could this baby have done in this lifetime, in that, in that two year time span as a baby before it's even morally developed, to deserve that? Because they don't believe in karma, they don't believe in rebirth. And how, why does God permit that terrible suffering? Seems like an innocent victim of suffering. The Hindu view is the, the soul of that baby is eternal. 
and has assumed many bodies in the past. And the suffering it's undergoing now at the age of two is a karmic result of what it did in a previous life. You see. And so it's, it, it, Hinduism is able to provide a much more comprehensive and satisfying answer to these kinds of issues that come up. And uh, in fact, there's a, there are many scholars who say this, but one of the most vocal is Arthur Herman. He wrote an entire book called The Problem of Evil and Indian Thought, published in 1971. And the first part of the book is devoted to surveying the different main responses to the problem of evil in Christian theology and arguing that each one of them falls short. And I'm not going to, if you're interested, just look at the book. But he's like, this is one response. Well, God gave us free will. And it's not his fault that we misuse our free will. He says, doesn't work for these reasons. And then he goes through a whole list of like, I don't remember how many, 16 or 20 different <laughs> responses to the problem of evil. None of them work. And he says, now let's look at the Indian side. They have this doctrine of karma. And that doctrine is so powerful from a theodical standpoint in explaining why there's so much suffering in the world that the problem of evil doesn't even come up very frequently in, in Indian context. And he says, because that karma doctrine is so comprehensive and so powerful in explaining, in accounting for so many different instances of suffering. And you see why, because it's comprehensive in this sense that it can even explain kinds of suffering that are inexplicable from the standpoint of, as I said, of, of one life paradigms like the Orthodox Abrahamic religions, which don't accept rebirth, which don't accept karma. Uh, you might ask, well, these people who believe in Christianity or Judaism, people who don't accept rebirth, will say, well, that's all nice and well and good, but why should we accept rebirth in the first place? Why should I believe in karma? Prove it. So here, this is a big issue, and I have two chapters on this in the book that I'm writing now. One on arguments for karma and rebirth, one arguments against, and looking at kind of both sides of, of the debate. So I can't go through all that now. Maybe that'll be a separate lecture eventually. But I want to just mention two arguments for rebirth, and then a couple arguments against rebirth, and how Hindus might respond to those arguments. So one argument for rebirth, uh, for rebirth. Jim Tucker is a contemporary scientist at the University of Virginia, and he's published a number of books with very interesting findings. He's investigated cases and still continues to investigate cases of young children living in the US primarily. So in a country where most people don't believe in rebirth, who claim to have memories of their previous lives. You can say, well, that's fine, but how is that proof? Because he has done painstaking research and investigation to, to, to verify many of those claims. And I'll give you just one quick example. There's a kid named, now he might be actually in his early 20s, I'm not sure how old he is, James Leininger. At the age of two, he started having terrible nightmares. Terrible nightmares. The parents just kind of brushed it off in the beginning. Every day almost, recurring nightmares. And then he starts talking during his nightmares. Mayday, mayday, plane's on fire. And then they're like, what in the world is going on here? And how does he know about all this stuff at the age of two? And so then they finally, they get really worried, and they ask him when he's awake, you know, what's going on? And he starts even drawing pictures of planes and crashing a plane on fire. And he gives little, de drops little details once in a while in the course of conversation. All sorts of details. He tells his parents he was a World War II fighter pilot in his previous life in Japan, and that his plane was shot down by the Japanese. He gave the exact name of his aircraft carrier, USS Natoma Bay. Extremely specific information, which a two-year-old could not possibly have gotten from any other, other source. And a bunch of other details, which Jim Tucker then verified. So that's just one example of many of really, really interesting cases of young children claiming to remember aspects of their previous life, which is arguably good empirical evidence for karma and rebirth, at least, at least rebirth, not necessarily karma. Uh, second is something that Swami Vivekananda emphasizes. He highlights Yoga Sutra 3.18, samskara sakshat karanat purva jati jnanam. By perceiving the samskaras, our latent mental impressions, yogis can gain direct knowledge of their past life. Everything we've done in our past lives is stored in the form of samskaras in our unconscious. And yogis, through a certain technique taught by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutra, by meditating deeply on those samskaras, those memories can come up again. 
And Swamiji says, so try it. Follow the technique taught by Patanjali and see whether you can remember your past lives. And in fact, Swamiji says, in a person's last birth, final birth, before liberation, they gain that, that knowledge of their past lives. Because it's only then that they are ready to kind of handle all that. If we knew what we did in our past lives, it's a different story. We'll get to that also in a second. So now, those are two arguments in favor of rebirth. What are some arguments against rebirth? Well, there are many. I'm just going to mention two. One, the objection from human population explosion. A very commonsensical objection. The human population has exponentially multiplied just in the past few decades. How is that a problem for rebirth? Well, because the number of souls, where do, if, there, if, if we've moved from one million people at, back in the past to now, what is it now, six billion or something like that? Maybe even, I don't know the exact. Eight billion. Eight billion, my goodness. Where are the souls coming from that inhabit these human bodies, these extra human bodies? <laughs> this is the problem. I mean, because in Hinduism, you don't, God doesn't just create souls. They're eternal. Where the heck are they? How do you fill these, all, these, the, the, all these bodies that are coming up? How do Hindus respond to this? By emphasizing that, number one, souls inhabit not just this Bhuloka, this earth, but there are other Lokas in which souls reside. One part of the answer. Secondly, souls inhabit not only human bodies, but also non-human animal bodies and even plants. You see, and Swami Vivekananda makes this point indirectly when he says, he, he, he wrote quite a bit when he spoke about rebirth a lot. He says, and Lord knows how he verified this, but he makes this claim, it's very interesting. He says, you'll notice that as the human population is increasing, the non-human animal population is decreasing. So those, what, what is, and then he says, because the souls in those non-human animal bodies are, are being promoted in a way. They're getting that job that they're being promoted into human bodies, hence the population explosion. So whether there's a good empirical evidence for that, Lord knows, it's very difficult. To, I mean, especially if you go into like the microbial level. It's tricky to tell like at, at what point you should stop. Like do microbes, do bacteria have souls? And so there's no real way to empirically verify it. But the Hindu's point is, by accepting other lokas, other realms in which souls reside, by accepting that souls can inhabit non-human animal bodies and plants, it completely changes, it, it, it at least raises, it, 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 it diffuses the force of that objection, of the, pop, of the human population explosion. Second objection, very commonsensical. If it's true that we lived many lives in the past, why is it that we don't remember our previous lives? Again, logical, I did so many things in this life, I remember I had oatmeal this morning. I take pride in my oatmeal, I make the oatmeal for everyone. And I know that I made oatmeal and that it was delicious, of course. I know that because I did it and because I remember it. How do I know that I had a previous birth if I don't remember a single thing about that previous birth? First response is, well, some unusual children do have memories of their past lives. And some of those cases have been, arguably have been verified. I don't want to be dogmatic about it. And so it's still sort of up in the air. And there are many people who poke holes, try to poke holes in Jim Tucker's research and his predecessor's research, Ian Stevenson, who's a real pioneer in this kind of research into rebirth cases. Uh, but there's, there's a deeper response to this lack of memory objection. What's the response? Swami Vivekananda said to Nivedita, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God, in her infinite wisdom, mercifully prevents us from knowing what we did in all our past lives. Because if we knew, we would be emotional and mental basket cases, and it would be very hard to function in this world. We'd be confused about our identity, and oh my goodness, why did I do that and that life? And You see, so what we've done in this life is enough. And that's part of God's wisdom that he has suppressed or withheld this knowledge until we're ready for it. Swami Vivekananda adds, in our last birth, right before liberation, we'll know. But it's only then that we can handle it, that we're mature enough from a spiritual standpoint to handle that information. Right now, if we get it, we'll, we'll learn us what will happen. So first element of Sri Ramakrishna saint making theodicy, karma. Second element, uh, and that's an evolutionary conception of karma as opposed to a retributive one. Second element, rebirth. Third element, it's what's called universal salvation or universal liberation. 
It's a hot topic now in philosophy of religion and theology. Sri Ramakrishna says it very succinctly. Everybody will surely be liberated. Every single soul will eventually attain liberation. All will surely, go, will, he says, all will surely realize God. All will be liberated. It may be that some get their meal in the morning, some at noon, and some in the evening, but none will go without food. All, without any exception, will certainly know their real self. What does he mean by the different meal times? Different births, right? So he's presupposing karma, rebirth. But everybody is guaranteed liberation in the end. Everybody will realize God or the higher self without exception. Nobody will be left out. He doesn't believe in an eternal hell for some souls. As opposed to, again, some of the orthodox religions throughout the world, including orthodox Christianity and orthodox Islam. They believe in an eternal hell. Even closer to home in terms of Hinduism, there's at least one tradition of Hinduism that believes in an eternal hell. Madhva's Dvaita Vedanta. He has what's called a hierarchy of souls, Jiva Taratamya. And he says, only some souls are destined for liberation. Other souls are destined to transmigrate endlessly without escape. They have to come back again and again. No liberation for them. Tough luck. But there's a worse category. Tamo yogyas, those who are destined for the darkness of eternal hell. And he says, it's like kind of Calvin's predestination, if, you, if you're familiar with John Calvin. Some people are just, they're just fated to go to hell. And eternal hell, for that matter. They're not going to get liberation. That poses an enorm enormous problem from the standpoint of the problem of evil. Why? Whatever we've done, however terrible it is, it's finite in the sense that we're finite beings with all sorts of human foibles and weaknesses, ignorance. We've done something. Why would a loving God punish us with an infinite punishment for something we did in a particular life that's at, even at its worst is still finite? This is a huge problem for any spiritual or religious tradition that accepts an eternal hell. And so even some liberal Christians and even some liberal Islamic theologians, I have a friend in University of Michigan named Imran Ijaz. He's done research on this. Even there's a medieval Islamic theologian named Ibn Taymiyyah, who he argues, of course, it's open to interpretation. He thinks that this medieval Islamic theologian also believed in universal salvation for everyone. But it's, it's controversial, within, and it's certainly not the orthodox Islamic position. The orthodox view in Christianity and Islam, there's an eternal hell. But there really is a big problem. God really can't be perfectly loving and omnipotent, and at the same time condemn some poor souls to an eternal hell. There could be temporary hells, as there is in Hinduism. But if you condemn them there for an eternity, there's a problem. So this is a huge, so I think that his saint-making theodicy is the whole package of three elements. An evolutionary conception of karma and rebirth. And then thirdly, not a single soul will be left out. So no matter how much we suffer in this life, no matter how much others suffer in this life, eventually each one of those poor souls will eventually have better births in the future ultimately culminating in their own liberation. What a wonderful source of solace for everyone, right? Absolutely not one soul will be left out. But there's a third and final element. For those of you who are familiar with my work or my talks, you probably know what's coming. And it also goes back to why I came up with this title of, for today's talk, Dissolving the Problem of Evil with the DIS in parentheses. So far, I'm suggesting that Sri Ramakrishna goes a long way towards solving the problem of evil via two things. Number one is a skeptical theist position. How can we understand God's ways with our finite human intellects? And secondly, with his saint-making theodicy, which consists in an evolutionary conception of karma and rebirth and the doctrine of universal liberation. But there's a third element to round off the whole thing. It's a spiritual appeal to the standpoint of Vigyana, this very special spiritual experience, realization, when one sees that there's nothing but God in this world, that God has become both avidya maya and vidya maya, both the maya of ignorance and the maya of knowledge. That's why I started this talk today with the mantra from the Chandi. Before the one I read, there are beautiful mantras about how salutations to you, O oh Mother, in the form of all sorts of wonderful things, beauty and goodness and intelligence, consciousness, 
Suddenly, the last one, she throws a wrench in the thing. Branti rupena samsita. I bow down to you again and again, O oh mother, in the form of error, weakness, delusion, confusion, evil. It's a, it's a kind of broad, broadened translation of Branti, but I think that's the gist. Don't think that God is only the good. God is equally evil. All the evil we see is also a manifestation of God. It's all part of her play. This is a third standpoint. I promised that I'd get back to that dialogue that I kind of paused when Hari asks, why does God permit all the suffering? Shramkrishna's response, it's all God's play. Then, the future Swami Turiyanji says, but this play of God is our death. Kelaiji amadir pranjai. Shram Krishna, smiling, he's smiling. Please tell me who you are. Please tell me who you are. God alone has become all this. Maya, jivas, the universe, and the 24 cosmic principles. As the snake I bite, and as the charmer I cure. It is God herself who has become both vidya, meaning knowledge, and avidya, ignorance. She remains deluded. Divine Mother herself remains deluded by avidya maya, the maya of ignorance. Again, with the help of the guru, she is cured by vidya maya. It's extremely interesting. Then she says, oh, she says, Sri Ramakrishna says, ignorance, knowledge, and intimate knowledge. The Bangla here is agyan, gyan, bigyan. Agyana, jnana, vigyana. Agyana means ignorance, first standpoint. Most of us are in that category, at least I am. Jnana, the standpoint of knowledge. Third category, vigyana, intimate knowledge of the divine truth. Then he says, the jnani sees that God alone exists and is the doer, that she creates, preserves, and destroys. The vigyani sees that it is God who has become all this. It's a very, very spiritually profound response to the problem of evil. It goes beyond just solving the problem of evil. This is what I would call dissolving the problem of evil. Dissolving. He gives a solution, and then he gives an even deeper spiritual dissolution of the problem of evil. Wittgenstein, some of you have probably heard of him, the great Austrian 20th century philosopher. He wrote a very difficult text called Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, a very pompous title. <laughs> At the end of the, this very, very technical treatise, he bursts out with these kind of mystical statements. He actually talks about the mystical in this otherwise extremely dry analytical work. And he says, has this beautiful aphorism. He says, the solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of the problem. Let me repeat. The solution of the problem of life is seen in the vanishing of the problem. That's what I call the dissolution of the problem of evil rather than just the solution. What does it mean? The problem doesn't arise. Why? In what sense? The problem of evil presupposes a difference between God on the one hand and us, his poor suffering creatures on the other. Surely, why does God let us suffer so much? That's the, that's the structure of the question, right? What does the standpoint of Vigyana say? It denies the very premise of the question. The problem of evil can't arise if you see nothing but God and if you know yourself to be God. Tell me who you are, Sri Ramakrishna tells Hadi, in that sense. So, look, after all these intellectual gymnastics and skeptical theism, fancy uh, terminology, saint-making theodicy, Sri Ramakrishna knows that for a, a, a poor mother uh, mourning the death of her five-year-old, this is weak consolation. It goes some way. It goes some way, and it helps. But I'll mention also, after my book was published, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, there's a great scholar named Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who's the vice chancellor of Ashoka University, now he's at Princeton. He wrote a review of my book in an Indian newspaper, where he was mostly all praise. And just in the context of chapter seven and eight, he says, in a very respectful way, but he says, you know, I don't disagree with uh, Mehta, at the time I was called Ayan Maharaj, because it's pre-Sanyasa, 2018. Says, Ayan Maharaj's interpretation of Sri Ramakrishna's solution of the problem of evil but still, it sort of, when you really are in the midst of suffering, it doesn't fully convince, you know, he says. And he says, I don't think that's necessarily a problem with inter or Maharaj's interpretation, but there's, intellect can only take you so far. Rational argumentation can only take you so far. Ultimately, Sri Ramakrishna says, you have to ascend to a higher spiritual standpoint, from which the problem of evil is not solved, but it doesn't even arise, it's dissolved. It doesn't even arise in the first place. 
I'll mention one incident in the life of Sri Ramakrishna which captures this. It involves a butterfly, a poor butterfly, with a splinter in its wing, and it's having trouble flying as a result. And Sri Ramakrishna sees this poor wounded butterfly and feels terrible pain for this butterfly. Thinks to himself, what cruel child inflicted this pain on this helpless, innocent butterfly? And then the next moment, he soars into a high spiritual state of ecstasy, which I take to be vigyana, although it's open to interpretation. And he starts laughing. He says, O oh Rama, you have created your own distress. As he bursts into laughter, Rama, you have created your own distress. He sees in that spiritual state of vigyana, the wounded butterfly, his divine mother, playing in the form of that butterfly, the cruel boy inflicting the, the, the pain on the butterfly, equally divine mother, playing in the form of the, of the torturer, the splinter itself, divine mother, playing in the form of that insentient splinter that the boy inflicts or sticks into the, the butterfly's wing. Nothing but God in this world. If there's nothing but God, the problem of evil doesn't arise because there's no one other than God to pose the question in the first place. And you see God playfully manifesting as everything in this world. So, to sum up this somewhat heady discussion, three main dimensions to Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil. Skeptical theism. Why should we even expect to understand God's ways with our finite human minds, our puny intellects? Second, a saint-making theodicy, which involves an evolutionary conception of karma and rebirth, and the doctrine of universal liberation. Each one of us will attain liberation in the end, if not in this life, then in a future life. And God is making saints out of each one of us through our experiences of both good and evil, happiness, pain, sorrow, sometimes devastation and tragedy. But third and finally, he then dissolves the problem of evil by ascending to the spiritual standpoint of vijnana, from which the very premise of the question of the problem of evil is denied, rejected, because there's nothing but God. And so there's the question of why God permits so much suffering in us or for us doesn't even arise, because there's no difference between us and God. If you want more details, please look at my book. But I just want to end very briefly by asking our, uh, each of us, we can ask, what is the practical relevance of all this? A couple things. When we experience suffering of any sort, Let's try our best as spiritual aspirants to see these as opportunities for spiritual growth. That's the right attitude of a spiritual aspirant. Anytime there's suffering, instead of feeling sorry for yourself, blaming God, ask yourself how I can grow morally and spiritually from this experience. So that's the first thing I'd suggest. Um, if you're interested, there's a very moving book called Man's Search, Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl published this in 1946. He was a Holocaust survivor. And he talks a lot about this, about how much he grew, how much he evolved spiritually, and how much others, other Holocaust victims even, grew in the course of their terrible ordeal. Swami Vivekananda used to say, suffering is a great eye-opener. And in fact, chapter one of the Gita is called Arjuna Vishada Yoga, the yoga of Arjuna's suffering. Suffering itself is a very potent yoga. If we see suffering as an opportunity for moral and spiritual growth. First practical tip. Second tip, what about suffering in others, Gaza and Moscow and all this? Instead of jumping to the conclusion that God is cruel, that he shouldn't have permitted this kind of suffering, we should keep in mind his response to the problem of evil, which is multifaceted, as I said. Skeptical theism, saint-making theodicy, this Vigyana-based kind of panentheism. Ultimately, there's nothing but God so that we can make some sense of why this suffering is happening. Not to say that we don't feel for these victims, obviously not. But so that we don't jump to the conclusion that God is wrong, that he shouldn't have done this or that. So we don't judge God so quickly and swiftly. And then you might think, well, wait a minute, but doesn't the karma doctrine throw a wrench into this whole thing? When somebody's suffering, Hindus say it's because of their own karma. So doesn't that logically mean that we should let them work out their own karma? Let them suffer. It's good for them. <laughs> God is making them into saints eventually. No. Why? 
Because if we witness a case of suffering and we are in a position to help that person, if we are in a position to alleviate that person's suffering or even that creature's suffering, and we don't do that, if we don't help them, we accrue bad karma. We harm ourselves. So it always behooves us to aid those in suffering, to feel compassion for them, and to help them when we can. And Sri Ramakrishna would often emphasize, Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva, that you should serve others in a spirit of worship by trying to see God in everyone, seeing the divine in everyone. By doing that, we grow tremendously. We become unselfish in a very natural way. And thirdly, and I'll end on this note, third practical tip, let's try not to be what I would call fair weather bhaktas. They're fair weather fans of sports teams. We only like the sports teams so long as they're doing well. The moment that they start sucking, we drop them like, <laughs> ah, I'm not interested. Then you move on to the next you know, number one team in the NFL or whatever, NBA. No. So if you really believe in God, you have to accept that God manifests not only as Vidya Maya, but also as Avidya Maya. And that we don't just thank God when we're in good circumstances and say, God, you're so great, I'm doing so well. When we're in the dumps, we should also say, God, there's some wisdom behind you putting me through this suffering, this experience. There's something I can learn from this. So purify my attitude. Teach me what I need to learn from this experience. That would be the attitude of a bhakta who's not a fair weather bhakta. Trust in God and trust that God has some reason for allowing us to suffer and allowing our loved ones to suffer, allowing others in this world to suffer, that we can't grasp with our finite minds, but let's not judge God for it or blame him. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Should I stand awkwardly next to you? Or, or sit on the other side? Yeah. I, I have to say Swamiji's lecture, I remember once when we were in the bookshop and something was happening and someone said, well, we're making a saint out of you. And the response was, I wonder why in this world there's so many saint makers and so few saints. <laughs> Today we have a very special event. We have a book signing of Maharaj's two books. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, right from the Vedic time, we, Vedanta and Hinduism has never expected people to check their brains at the door. They've been told, no, you should question, you should uh, ask questions and then ultimately go on to spiritual practice, but it should be based on a foundation of rationality. And um, even the most devotional traditions, as Maharaj has said, have a foundation of philosophical, uh, a philosophical foundation rooted in the scriptures. But the Ramakrishna tradition being somewhat new, um, we don't have very much in that line. And this, I think, this may be even the first where Swamiji has attempted to do this, to take the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda and show the philosophical underpinnings, the philosophical foundation of it. Some people may say, well, Sri Ramakrishna's teachings are simple, but then we remember Swami Vivekananda's thing where someone said this and he went on and expounded for a long, long time on a very simple parable of Sri Ramakrishna showing how profoundly philosophical it was. So if you were interested in getting this, we have them in the bookshop. I know some of you have already got them, but um, we ask that you first come into the bookshop and get them, and then Maharaj will sign them at the end of the satsang. For those of you who may be seeing this on YouTube, either now or at a later date, Vedanta Catalog has these books. If you would like a signed version when you order, please send us a note saying, I'd like a signed version and we'll put Maharaj to extra work. <laughs> Thank you. So music first, then announcements? Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna give the announcement now. All right, so ho hope to, s huh? Yeah, yeah, hope to see some of you at the Q&A here 
in the greenhouse living room. Sorry, let me go in sequence. There are refreshments outside, so please help yourself to the refreshments. Then there's going to be a Q&A in the greenhouse living room with me. And then at 12.45, it will transform into a book signing in the very same area. So please come if you're interested. Next Sunday, March 31st, is Swami Arupeshanandaji's Sunday talk called Resurrection. Is that it? I think that's it. I hope so. Yeah. Mm -hmm.